thank you everyone for coming again to our final of three presentations. Uh, this one, as you can see, by AIM, the 2011 AIA Firm of the Year. Um, we had a great success in determining how we were going to get speakers this year. I think that next year we're going to follow suit and again ask you who you would like to see uh, because that's really what's important to the board is making sure you guys are seeing the value from the organization that you're a part of. So be thinking who you might like to see for 2012. And um, again, use our Facebook, go to our website. Um, those are all great resources for you um, to use. So I'm going to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, it's Casey Cassius. He's a principal uh, and a director of practice at EIM. He's a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and also a lead accredited professional. As Director of Practice for BNIM, Casey Cassius has continued to challenge the status quo and progress throughout the leadership within our firm and industry. His efforts have influenced the creation and new methodologies and industry tools that deliver solutions to the ever-changing challenges of the 21st century. Casey's leadership has been widely celebrated and has led to many awards, including the Green Building Leadership Award presented at USGBC's Green Build Conference in 2009. <clears throat> Sorry, in 2009, Casey was named Kansas State University's Alumni Fellow for the College of Architecture, Planning, and Design. A leader in his firm in local and professional communities, Casey's advancements in collaboration, project delivery, and sustainable design elevate standards for design and performance. Casey has a distinctive ability to unite and empower teams. While collaboration between firms is commonplace in today's architectural practice, it is uncommon to lead the collaborative process in a way that both is rewarding to the team and client involved, and that results in superior ability. Casey has done this time and time again. He possesses a wide diversity of project type experience, most involving complex consulting and owner teams, which utilize his strength and facilitator and his ability to synthesize group input into a cohesive whole. He has served as a project architect, project manager, or project principal for a wide variety of BNIM projects. Recently, he served as principal and project manager on the expansion and renovation of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in collaboration with the Stephen Hall Architects, currently in fulfilling a similar role on the Kauffman Center for the Performing Arts, the new premier venue for performing arts underway in downtown Kansas City, and in collaboration with Mosh Moshe Safi and Associates, among other projects. Casey is an active member of the American Institute of Architects. He has served in numerous positions in the Kansas City chapter, including Secretary, Director, and Chapter President in 1999. He is currently chairing a task force for the chapter that is studying the role of design, build, delivery methodology. Additional AIA activities include chairing several local and regional AIA design and craftsmanship board programs. He is also a member of the Society of College and the University Planning, SCEP, as well as an active community member. He has just completed six-year ter six terms for both the Heart of America Boy Scouts Properties Committee and as a board member for the Wildwood Outdoor Education Program, providing disadvantaged urban youth with an outdoor educational experience focusing on teamwork and leadership skills. It is my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Casey Cassius. So I'm going to give you all a heads up. Um, I woke up Monday morning with a really bad cold. And this morning I was in my office and I started sneezing and I could not stop. So I hope to God that does not happen tonight. But uh, just as a morning, I took a cough drop right before I got up here and it doesn't happen. Um, so obviously that was a marketing piece that somebody wrote. Uh, a lot of mistruths, I'm sure. Uh, so I, I did graduate from K-State in 1974. Um, I did have to be alumni <laughs> from K-State in 2009, which I can't quite figure out why they picked me, but they did, which was really a fun thing. Um, I'm currently chairing the Dean's Advisory Committee at K-State, and uh, that, that's been really fun. I've been now for a number of years. Um, I'm born and bred a Midwesterner. So anyway, that's, that's enough. Um, so interestingly, Jay called, I believe, the day after the award was announced and asked if we would come up here. And we didn't have a clue.
clue as to what was going on, and I kind of put him off and said, well, let us figure out what it is we're doing and how we're going to do it, and I'll get back to you. So here we are almost a year later, and uh, anyway, it's been a very fun year. It's been an interesting year. We've learned a lot. Um, we have kind of a stock presentation that we chose to use throughout the year that we've done around the country, and Steve McDowell and I primarily have done these uh, generally together, but a few of them separately just because of the timing. So before I start, I want to acknowledge a couple of things. Um, certainly, in the history of the firm, Bruce Patty, Bob Bergamot, and Tom Nelson um, have been mentors extraordinary to all of us who come through the office. Um, Bruce left somewhere along the way, I think in 1993, 94, but he was certainly important in the founding years of the firm. And Bob and Tom continue to work to this day, both in their mid-70s. Uh, Tom, only on pro bono, Things he wants to do, but he's always there for lunch. And Bob Bergwald hasn't slowed down a day, and I believe he celebrates his seventh birthday. And his comment to me was, as long as you put up with me, I can be here. So we've been very fortunate to have the two of them act as our mentors along the way. So with that, I'm going to start. Um, when we first found out about the Committee on Design uh, nominating or wanting to nominate the NIM for the award, I, I chair our executive committee. And I was just, I would thought it was just the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard. I mean, it just, you and I, mean, come on, we're a small firm in the Midwest, what are you talking about? And I uh, immediately said, no, we shouldn't do it. And I thought about it overnight and came back and said, okay, Steve and Bob, if you guys want to explore it, go explore it. And they came back all pumped up, and I still was the naysayer throughout the whole deal until I saw the final presentation that David Lake gave to the guy. And when I saw the presentation and the story that was told in the presentation, and I have to say, it is a story because you get, uh, I might be wrong about the time, but you get a total of 40 slides to tell your firm's history, and I think it's 12 minutes at the board level. And you're not in the room, you have to have an advocate, and that's how they make the selection. And they weed it down from you know 60 people, who some of whom are self nominated, some of whom are nominated from committees, and then you go in, and then ultimately the board votes on it. So it's, it's a very bizarre process, but. Uh, David Lake was a wonderful advocate for us and really helped us put the PowerPoint together. So anyway, that's enough about that. So the award itself, you know, there's one given nationally each year to a firm that's consistently produced distinguished architecture over a minimum period of 10 years. Generally, there are firms that have a lot of national design awards. That's not us. We have a lot, a number of design awards, but they're not on the national level. But we work really hard to produce good architecture. There's only five criteria. The first one is, you know, clearly they believe that the efforts that Bob Berkebein and BIM put into sustainable design was critical in, in the profession. And so that was kind of the first, the first point. The second one was this consistency for the level and depth of execution of what they're doing. And for me, that really hit home because I really, I'm not a designer. I mean, I'll be very candid about that. I love putting buildings together and I'm very passionate about it, but I'm not the designer. If you give me a blank piece of paper, I'm in trouble. But if you give me something to design in, I can jump into it and do a lot. So I, I felt really good about this. Um, the next one was about collaboration. And one of some of the comments to many go about building bridges. And I think that's what we all do each and every day. And there's more and more collaboration than what we do. And I would guess in our office right now, 75% of our work is collaborating with other firms. So that was very important. Um, and then there was this area, idea of um, how we approach our design and having a broader focus. So it's not just about the building, but it's about the building's impact in the community. And so that was another area that they really looked at hard, kind of how you really focus the community design and, and integrating the work into the community at a broader level. And then last is ultimately about design. And, and yes, certainly we've received a number of design awards, not very many national awards, but um, I think consistently So I just thought it was important that you all kind of have an understanding of what the criteria is that the National AIA uses. So there's, this presentation is really kind of set up in several parts and there's way too many slides, so I'm going to fly through them. But um, anyway, it, it really talks about um, this whole idea of what our practice is and our path to being sustainable and really increase, increasing human potential. And I think that's the thing we really focused on over the last 20 years. Um, it, it really just starts with the with the culture in the office and the set of values that we had in the office that were founded by Bruce, Bob, and Tom back in 1970 when they started the firm, being engaged in the community. This is uh, at least the Kansas City office today. We have an office in Des Moines and an office in Houston as well, and a couple of folks on the West Coast. Um, but Tom Nelson used to always say every year at the Christmas party, and I always kind of dismissed it. 
staff than we've ever had before. But I really believe that. I think we have more smart, capable people than we've ever had before, and it's, uh, it's an honor to work alongside of them. I know some of you probably got to see Amy Slider speak at the um, AIA Nebraska conference. Um, she was just a powerhouse. She was a national AIA architect award recipient. I've had the opportunity to work with her for the last five and a half, six years on projects. And she's just exhibited an example of a lot of the caliber of people in the firm. So we're always looking for a better way to do things, to, to uh, really go beyond and not do just what is expected, but really what's out there, what's the next thing. And really looking at uh, the triple bottom line, the economic, social, and environmental quality of the system. We're passionate about this idea of generous designs, the taking cues from nature, and really believing that it inspires people and can make changes for a better world. And we always strive to be excellent in everything we do, um, to really push, our, push ourselves, both in performance and in execution. And we truly care about what our buildings do and the impact they have on society as a whole. This is the Ronald McDonald House that, uh, that we were involved in. And uh, this is the second Ronald McDonald House we've had in Kansas City. So maintaining those client relations over a 25 year period is extremely important. And the whole idea of being authentic and being real and, and being true to what you believe is absolutely critical. Um, and we want everybody to think what we do is fun. I think that's absolutely important. I, we read an interview recently, and I made the comment as in the closing comments to our client. One of the reasons we wanted to work with them because we had this five-year relationship. And our, project, our project manager told me at lunch what a fun group they were to work with, and that's how we wrapped up the interview. And 20 minutes later, I'm driving back home from Springfield, Missouri, and the client called and said, "You know what? The most important thing you said to us in the interview was that we're fun to work with." And you know, so, so we got the job. And to me, I was just trying to figure out how do I close this thing. So if it is, it's important to enjoy what we do every day. We really embrace diversity in everything, um, voice and your skill and the perspective, and we value every opinion at the table all the time. We really believe in integrated thinking from the get-go, involving our consultants and our clients in every decision along the way, and then collaborating in this process of discovery. And really challenge kind of the idea of both innovation and replication. But this kind of core value that we have that, that, that delivering beautiful, integrated, living environments that inspire and challenge and enhance the human condition is, is kind of a core value that we've held for some time now, and, and we use it constantly as we try to value our work. We also really believe in being involved in our community at every level. We encourage all of our staff to do that all the time. And uh, we like to have parties. This is our office. Uh, it's a great party space. We probably have a party there almost monthly in some form or another. We make it as an open house on Friday nights for our Fridays. Uh, we actually have a now effectively a member of our staff, John Rao, who started out as an artist in residence. We had kind of a, every four months a different artist coming into the office. Well, John, just we adopted him, or he adopted us because he now has a permanent workspace there for those there. And so we downsized, we had extra space, so we now have an artist and resident in, in our office. Um, we also very much believe in uh, car free living, and I promise you in Kansas City, probably much more like Omaha. That's not a very easy thing to do, but we do have a bike share program. We do um, provide uh, support uh, bus passes for anyone who wants to get in the office, and about 30% of our staff provides the bus to the front work. So we a real advocate of that. Uh, we also have been very involved in um, activities in the city trying to take parking spaces back away and put the life back on the street. So once a year we go around and capture parking spaces and then put events out in the parking spaces to try and encourage folks to realize you don't have to drive your car. Um, we've been involved in programs like Tulips on Truce, which is historically been a racial divide in Kansas City, where we take our primarily white residents and go into the City and get very actively involved in minority participation and be involved in those neighborhoods, uh, whether it's housing, whether it's planting these things, but being just a member of the community. Um, this is a particularly interesting story. You see Bob Brookmiller cutting up wood. Um, we were designing the Edith Gorman Discovery Center, and I got a call on Saturday from Bob. He was driving around the city market and he saw this old building being torn down in the river market. Wonderful wood frame beams, heavy timber construction, and we were designing the new discovery center. Working drawings were already done, and it was going to be a new land structure, and it was all this. And I was like, I want to buy the building, but I want to convince our owner to use this rather than. 
and ship it to the man because he got on top to be a contractor who was doing all the building. Um, I told Bob he couldn't do it. I said, I can't commit the firm's money to doing that when the client's not on board. Well, Bob personally bought the building and convinced the client to do it. And then every piece of scrap that was in that came out of that lumber, we had people in our office um, taking that and then building the floor from every scrap of lumber. And they also then redesigned the entire building so that we could use the heavy timber. Um, it was not a good investment for Bob, I have to tell you, unfortunately. Uh, financially, it didn't work very well. But it really got the office involved in a really wonderful project. And we had 25, 30 people there every weekend with chop saws. And I just was so thankful at the end of it, nobody got their finger off and nobody got hurt because it was a really crude process. But all the floors were there, and you know, that, that pattern there, I mean, the rain, oh, so I don't talk way too long about that. Um, and we've always embraced technology. When I joined the firm in 1983, uh, partners had bought this computer for a quarter of a million dollars, and the three partners actually um, mortgaged their houses to be able to find it. And after it went out of date, they continued to spend about $1,500 a month for several years after it quit working, just because they couldn't let go of that investment. I just think people are crazy. But anyway, so uh, it's always been a big commitment. We've been a beta site for Autodesk for a number of years with Revit and Vim starting before 2000. Uh, so we've always really embraced this idea of technology. I think it's very important. Uh, yeah, but we still build a lot of models using wood or chipboard, uh, phone board. So we really try to study that way. And we also, uh, some of the folks in the office still also embrace some more current technology like these kinds of things, which I have to admit are past me. Um, but whether it's Facebook or Twitter, um, we're very involved in all the social media trying to get the word out, particularly this year because of the National Firm Award, we really tried to engage an awful lot of technology. Uh, we had, um, I'm going to tell you a long number now, but over 10,000 hits the day of the day day after the award of the National Convention on our website. So we monitor it very carefully. Um, and then we also use technology um, in our projects. And this is the case of my next award. We've been working very hard to gather data from communities. We're doing a lot of work in Tuscaloosa right now from the tornado recovery. And we had over 38,000 people in Tuscaloosa provide ideas to what they wanted in their community because the city couldn't pay for the community meetings. They didn't want to pay enough fee. So one of our staff members came up with this idea of posting out on my, my mixer, and within the first week, 38,000 people responded. So we're constantly looking for new ways to, to get the word out. Um, our home is in Kansas City, but we also have offices in Houston, Des Moines, and Southern California, and projects all over the country. Um, we, we've always been focused on Kansas City first. Um, it's, you know, it's our home, it's where we live, it's where we are engaged in the community. Um, Bob Bergeron uses this quote a lot about how you predict the future, and that's really the best ways to design it. And that was a Bucky Fuller quote, he was one of his instructors when he was in school. Um, Kansas City is about 300 square miles, has about 2 million people. Uh, obviously, it started as because of the confluence of the Missouri and Kansas rivers. Um, it's, it's a bit unique, it's you know, well known for its parks and boulevards, fountains, barbecue. But this past decade has really seen an explosion of urban revitalization. And we've been fortunate to be very involved in that. The, the darker squares you see on the model here, which is downtown Kansas City, the projects we've been involved in, uh, they get <coughs> almost 20 million square feet of office projects, and about 80,000 people reside in those offices during the day. Uh, just like you all, it's, uh, Kansas City is very much an odd place, if you will. It's kind of Tallgrass Prairie to the west and the Ozark Woodlands to the east. And it gets cold and colder than cold and wetter than wet, so it's a tough place to build buildings, but we really like that. But it's a challenge. Andrew Payne and Rudolph uh, Alcori um, wrote a book, have actually written a couple of books now uh, about the firm, and they use this term generous pragmatism. And we've kind of taken that and used it a lot. And it's more about the ability 
We've enjoyed uh, designing uh, lots of living uh, buildings, if you will, uh, places where people live, from uh, the single family residents using uh, container houses uh, for Debbie Glassberg, uh, to a whole series of multifamily dwellings in the River Market area of Kansas City, to homes for our, uh, ourselves, to homes for those without homes, in this case, the City Union Mission, and for places in the City Union Mission for them to reside, whether it's dining, study, or basketball, to custom homes that are outside of Kansas City here in uh, Platte County for Mark Wilson, who's director of the Nelson Haggins Museum, uh, to homes for the first sustainably designed home in Kansas City for Habitat for Humanity, uh, my partner, Royal Esneski, was the president of Habitat for a number of years, and so this was one of our undertakings to really do a uh, sustainable home for them, uh, and, and including an awful lot of work environments, uh, 20, 20 million square feet and counting in Kansas City, um, just scattered around for various clients, um, a lot of them in urban environments, some in suburban places, um, for government clients here in the City Hall renovation that we did, um, for um, the county, uh, Fort Osage Education Center, to state facilities, this being uh, Missouri Department of Conservation and <coughs> Building, uh, to federal buildings downtown where we've done major renovations, to uh, the IRS Service Center, which is about a 1.1 million square foot building, which happened to be an AIA Top 10 Award winner for the Committee on the Environment. And these are all within Kansas City. We also um, have a lot of experience and good fortune working in renovations and uh, other, other environments. This was a project, second or third project actually that the office ever had. Bob Rickabile was involved in the restoration of the Folly Theater. When they started, there was four feet of pitching water on the roof in the ceiling space above there. It was just amazing. The whole thing had collapsed because it was all wire ties. And by the grace of God, I got all of it out before all the ceiling all came in. And you can kind of see, it was a poster child actually for the National Historic Trust for a number of years to show what you can do when you restore these old buildings that have been collected for so long. Um, for um, outdated and small buildings in midtown, turning them into lively art spaces, much like this, in fact, um, to the now 12 years of work that we've done at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City. Uh, renovating the entire existing building, plus the work that we did with Stephen Hall for the block building. Um, and uh, in fact, we're currently doing three other projects now with Stephen, so it's been a very good long term relationship. Uh, to the Hoffman Center for Performing Arts that just opened uh, in September in uh, the Motion Softies office. Uh, to the uh, work that we did at Kansas City Zoo uh, in the mid 90s, we renovated the entire zoo. First, uh, AIA top 10 award recipient in the various entry pavilion. Um, who work at the Union Station, where we have the Science Center wing. Uh, bridges that uh, link to the Missouri River. In this case, a new pedestrian bridge down to the river. And in this case, an old railroad bridge that we took and moved and put it back over the um, freight house district so that you could get across the railroad tracks back to the Union Station. We've worked a lot with Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. Um, we very much enjoy that. In fact, many of our, our own children have been to these camps and so we've been engaged in that. And a lot of educational projects. Uh, this happens to be a photo of Greensburg, Kansas. Um, this is uh, the Janus Library Edition in Kansas City, Missouri, at Kansas City Art Institute, uh, Paseo High School in Kansas City, Earthworks, which is the primary school. Project that was really trying to get kids in touch with nature to the Anita Woman Discovery Center that we saw earlier. This, this building is a little bit interesting. It's the first building in the state of Missouri that had a living machine in it, so it all based in the building went through the living machine and didn't actually go to the sewer. Uh, so it was a real educational opportunity for people to understand that, uh, how, how the waste can be handled ecologically. Uh, to the work at the Fort Learning Center and at the Nelson Gallery again. So probably the single most important piece that, that brought us to the right, I think, was the work in sustainability. And in 1987, 
I was on the AIA nominating committee and I asked Bob Erdenbile if he would run for AIA president in Kansas City. And he had been asked repeatedly and he always said no. And this time he said yes and he said, I'll only do it because I have an agenda and I want to change the way we build buildings and I think it's important that we reduce the use of our carbon footprint, but really be sustainable and have a approach and we agree with And in 1989, it might have been 90, I'm a little bit fuzzy on this, um, AIA Kansas City went to the national board and asked that um, they adopt this at the national board level and we were immediately turned down. Uh, Bob, not being swayed, was a good friend of his, Vernon Reed, found out how you could make a motion for the floor at the convention and went to the Seattle chapter, the Boston chapter, and the St. Louis chapter and convinced them to co support the motion to create a committee on the environment and uh, it passed unanimously for the floor. And then, as a way of penalty to Bob, they asked, they chose him to be the chair of the first <laughs> committee. And uh, subsequent to that, he's uh, been actively involved in the creation of USGBC and LEAD and AIA Top 10, uh, and just along and along and along. So uh, that, that certainly was something that, that probably put a small firm from Kansas City on the map. Uh, we had the good fortune to have been involved in seven national AIA top 10 award, green award buildings, most recently the uh, School of Green from Kansas, and starting with the Drains building in 1999, which was the first class. Um, yeah, I, we don't have the most, but uh, if you look at a firm of 75 people and compare it to the number of people, we certainly have the most per capita. Uh, so this is a little history lesson on timeline, which is kind of what we do, and there's kind of four sections of this. One starts being on like deep green, the next one's really in high performance integrated design, and finally on uh, generous design and community. And I'll, I'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, this whole idea of deep green and deep design was really rooted in the idea that you can't do one without the other, that it really is critical that a building is not only works well functionally, it's beautiful, but it also has to perform at a very high level. And, and so we really started looking at these buildings and how do they improve people's lives in the environment. And, and that they do have to be beautiful along the way. And whether they're offices, in this case it was a million square foot renovation of an old World War II munitions plant, plant in Kansas City where we did these insertions of art throughout the plant to turn it into an office building for GSA. Uh, to how you think about um, an auditorium for a science lab that, where we convince the scientists to put the science on display so it's right on the main street in Houston, Texas, and it's an all-glass auditorium, and they just absolutely love it. Um, or um, you know, how light is experienced in the Nelson Gallery, um, how you look at transparency and opacity, and the juxtaposition between the old and the new. Uh, similarly, how light is seen in the interior of the building and how it's ever changing to how light is seen in the old and the new. So, continuous exploration. To how we collect light with solar sh light shells here. This is uh, the uh, Iowa Utilities Board building in Moines that just opened that uses about a third of the energy that the normal building would use. Um, and how we look at making small buildings bigger, in this case the Greenberg City Hall, by extending the, the porch awning and having to reach up to the, the very simple methodology that would have been used back when the buildings in the small city hall were built in rural America. Um, we constantly like to collaborate. In this case, Debbie Glassberg came to us with this idea of taking some, some um, containers, uh, train containers, and turning them into a bubble in a classic neighborhood. City, and we're now working with her to try and do this across the nation and really kind of focus on doing these whole series of these around the country. You kind of see the space between, uh, we always use the term, it's contained space and, and uh, space contained. Buildings always have to perform at an exceptionally high level, and the performance is always critical. We started this effort back in the mid-1980s, uh, very early, before we even knew what we were doing in the way of green design. This was an office building for mass design where we were really looking at optimizing the envelope, making a very narrow, shallow building to optimize daylight. And it was really kind of our first effort to really use low embodied energy in the building. We moved from there to a project in Montsasabi Wright in uh, British Columbia, Vancouver. The old growth trees that you see behind the building were actually the site. And we 
street. And by coincidence, directly across the street, they were in the process of tearing down an old building. And we took all the wood from the old building and made it the building for the frame for this building. So the wood that was using there for a warehouse and for which we were tearing down. None of which was planned, it just happened. We were just there at the right time. Um, it's the first time we used compost and toilets. The building's not connected to the sewer system. Um, I remember this was going on in 1992. Bob came to me and was asking me, and I just thought, we're going to make a suit. No, um, but it didn't happen, and they've been very happy with it. And in fact, a year later, after the building opened, they were running ads in the student newspaper asking people to please come kind of use the urinals and the water closets because they weren't getting enough liquid to decompose the solid materials. So they were actually, please come, students, use the building. Um, but, but it's worked perfectly. So outreach for urban, this, this building is actually at 47th and Truist in Kansas City in the middle of the urban core. And the whole idea of this building is teaching children about, urban children about nature. So we really had to create a, a rustic rural environment with nature in it so the kids could come and understand what nature was really like but never had the opportunity to get out. Uh, I already told the story about this one, but all the wood members you see here came out of the warehouse in River Market in Kansas City, and the kids are looking into the uh, living machine here, and uh, the building's been remarkably successful in terms of their programs in the inner city. Along the way, we, we fell into some really good fortune. Um, Bob was able to convince uh, National Institutes of Science to help support the study that we did for a new lab building in Montana State. The building never got completed, but he managed to get $5 million worth of research grants to study fume hoods and fume hoods effects. And the low flow fume hoods that are all used in labs today came out of this study. Um, so it was just, you know, just dumb luck in a way. We just kept looking and the, and the legislature ultimately chose not to build the building, but we learned an awful lot and this was a wonderful partner along the way. We also had the opportunity to work with the Packard Foundation in the early 90s, and uh, the, uh, the idea of a living building came out of this work. It's the first time we used the term of living building, which now is, is fairly common, and the living building challenge is something that we all know about. Um, and, and the Packard Foundation, one of the requirements of working with it is that all this make, information be made public so we can compare the costs um, the life cycle costs of these buildings um, from starting with market value going to lead certified, lead silver, lead gold, and really quantify them and understand what the benefits were. And, and as an example, over the life, 100 year life of the building, a lead platinum building would cost $62 million, where a market building would cost $218 million to operate over the life of the building. So when you look at things beyond first cost and look at operations, there's no choice that we should have all our clients on doing. This was one of the first times it really got quantified. We had an economics team from um, Berkeley work with us to actually prove all the numbers. So it's been pretty, pretty well justified. So the buildings have to be beautiful, I think, at the end of the day. This is a project where um, we didn't win the project. We were competing with Polk Stanley on the project. They were selected. About three months later, we got a call from the owner and said, you know, we really think that the architects we selected don't really understand sustainability like you do. Would you be willing to join the team? So we were the sustainability consultant on the project after it got started, which was which was a bit unique. Um, so this whole notion of integrated thinking, I think, is absolutely critical in everything we do. At the end of the day, the, the darker green color is what the investment is in the way of people that are inside the building. So 82% of the building is consumed by the people costs. 10% is consumed by technology, and 3% operations over the life of the building. So it's always important to think about how you make the people most effective inside of the building. And that's, you know, what drives everything we do. Uh, we always use this idea that no one knows as much as everyone. We're trying to get everyone at the table from the day we start. All the consultants, all the users, and that there's this kind of continuum in the process, and it doesn't matter if you're looking at the whole design process or each and every there's always this circle that goes around and you're researching, designing, building, the Occupy, and then you learn. And every decision you make has that cycle to go through. 
Steve um, kind of came up with this little diagram probably 15, 20 years ago about this idea of taking something from intuitive to scientific to experiential and how you start with a sketch that you really investigated in the model stage <coughs> at the end of the day, you really see it in construction and experience and we use that time and time again kind of as we go through the design process. And as we look at buildings, how we model them for daylight, uh, for energy performance, and, and the software programs get so much better each and every day now in terms of how you can do this with rather than other things to really have supporting systems to understand exactly how much light, exactly how much defaults. So it's, it's you're not surprised at the end of the day. I think mean, that's really important. And this was a project that, was, that you just saw at the School University of the University of Texas, where we actually started this idea of looking at the fifth facade, which was really the roof facade, and thinking about photovoltaics on the roof and how we capture water, and uh, really looking at the science. And similarly, same time period as an office building for the state of Missouri. And in each case, both of these buildings use about half the energy that the normal building does, and they're now more than a decade old. Uh, and really using the idea of layers of design and really looking at each and every layer, whether it's communications or IT or mechanical systems or vertical circulation, but really understanding that within the context of the model of the building. And these were early sketches, and now we do it on pretty much every project to understand how they, how they all work together. We're always looking at different systems. This was the Omega Center, which is the first living, first living building that was actually verified as a living building. And it started with just a series of very simple sketches about how to capture the water, how to capture the sun, uh, how to deal with the humidification. And from that, it just then started getting into the very detailed studies of what the exact conditions were on site. Um, always started with this climate data on every project. And then really studying it. And what we found in the model, which was really in a way counterintuitive, was that the skylight placement didn't want to be directly over the living machine, machine, but actually rather further to the north because direct light didn't help the plants. It was more the indirect light that actually reflected light and made the plants grow better. But we didn't know that initially until we really did the studies and studied how much light it got on the plant material. So, you know, look, if having I had the tools to do that, we probably would have put the skylight in the wrong spot. Not probably, we would have put the skylight in the wrong spot. Um, to really get kind of understanding how deep light can penetrate by using models and the tools that we have. Um, we've been very fortunate to be able to attract really capable young architects who are interested in the science of architecture. And uh, that's, that's always been a very good thing. I look at that, I couldn't possibly do that. But the, 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 the current generation coming out of school knows how to do all this stuff. We've also used um, what I would like to describe as the social tools. Um, in this case, it's the noise that rose, where we're trying to evaluate values on the building and how you determine with the client early on which things are most important and which things you really need to focus on. And the idea of this is, is that the room starts at zero and goes to ten. And you try and see, oh, let's pick one, um, you know, how well the crazy new job is and how, how full the pedal is. And the closer you are to the full pedal, the more successful you are in the overall project. So we're just kind of taking these techniques and using them over time. Um, and this would happen to be a project that we were doing in North Charlotte, South, North Charleston, South Carolina, uh, in the Flint Noise Act community. And we sat and had a whole series of community engagements and looked at social issues, environmental issues, economic issues, and then specific goals that the owner had. We tried to value them and constantly weigh them against that as we moved the project forward. And looking you know, constantly at different design alternatives, which I'm sure we all do. Um, looking, working with the city of Seattle on their um, community tools to help people understand the importance of sustainable design. All the graphics and all this was done in house back in the, uh, right around 2000 in the city of Seattle, and we were just really figuring out a lot of what we meant and how we could do work. Um, collaborating with our engineers to try and figure out how to create the most integrated systems, in this case for the Sarah Research Building at the uh, University of Texas Health Science Center. And really understanding the atrium is actually heated and cooled with free air because the office building that's on the left takes in all the air, the air is run across, and then the laboratory exhausts the air on the other side. So all we're doing is using the air that's already pre-cooled and then exhausts. 
exhausting the air through the building on the other side in the laboratories. So it didn't cost anything to keep the cool the issue. And we're also very engaged in constantly monitoring our buildings after they're built so we know how they perform and if they're doing what we thought they did. We have, currently have about 16 buildings that we're monitoring around the country that are high performing buildings. Um, the two on the left actually are not performing like they should. And what we've discovered is they're not being used like we anticipated. They're either being used much longer during the day or they ignore the temperature settings and they're moving the temperature settings all over the place. So how a client ultimately uses the building has a huge impact on its performance. And these are just some examples of um, projects that we have where you, know, you might see that absenteeism was reduced in the case of the state office building uh, or order increases were just remarkably higher after they moved into the new spaces to the Omega Center, which uses no water and no energy. is completely off the grid. It creates all its own water and its own energy. Uh, school of Nursing, uh, which was a very, very early project for us. It was probably completed in 2003. Um, you know, the idea in Houston that recycling construction waste, uh, they didn't have, I mean, you suggested it to the contractor, what that you like, you were an idiot. But uh, we were able to convince them to do it because we had a client who was absolutely committed, and we were able to get the program started, and now they do almost all the work down there to be qualified. The Omega Center um, is, 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 as I said, the first living building and the first big flat building combined. It is off the grid. It's at 98% of its spaces are day lit. 100% of its energy is for renewables. 100% of its water is managed on site. And 99% um, of its construction waste is diverted. So it is one of those really nice projects that you know, Greensburg School, after the first year, is actually about 52% energy savings. The model showed 48. Uh, Can't see power and light that we just recently completed. We had anticipated 24% energy savings. The actual first year was at 44%. So, so we're seeing really good data. So doing all this requires a lot of precision um, and really understanding what you're doing in the buildings. And that's, for me, that's what I really love to do. So I, I threw some of these in. I think the opportunity to work on buildings like this is what makes it all worthwhile. Um, when we were pursuing this project with Stephen, we asked him what the most important thing was to get selected. And he said for him, it was all about precision and doing you know, things exceptionally well. Uh, the building is 870 feet long from end to end. It's primarily underground. A lot of things have never been done in the building before and likely will never be done again. Uh, first thing in the um, program that was written by the museum expert was don't put the museum on the ground. So the first thing Stephen did was put the building on the ground. So we were working from the you know, kind of out of the hole, no pun intended, throughout the project. Uh, but, but learning you know, kind of about how to model and why, how to get the lenses to work, how to be energy efficient in the process, and try to make this as low well energy consuming as you can, and even in the context of constantly being 72 degrees and 50% relative humidity was a great challenge. Uh, but how it integrates in the light landscape, it folds into the landscape, uh, how light is in there, figuring out how to document all of it so that it can be built, and then going from there to the Kaufman Center for Portland Arts, um, and start to see some of the complexity of these slides. Um, and I was talking to someone earlier from Enterprise Precast, which is what Precast uh, Precast is in Xander Sheet Metal. Uh, so we had great subcontractors. Uh, no one was glazing the wall on the south side. Um, and, and going from this, the, the team that I worked with on, on block building, we all just transferred to this building. So for a decade, we worked together. There were five of us who worked together for that 10 year period, which was really quite wonderful. And I should say also including the general contractor and the superintendent and assistant superintendent. So we survived each other. And these are the interior spaces and the halls that you haven't had a chance to see. They're acoustically exceptional halls. Uh, two, two different halls. And then the ballet center that we just completed in Kansas City that opened about oh, four weeks ago. Same kinds of studies and spaces. We don't have any interior shots yet. 
And then this idea of generous pragmatism when we really look at nature before leaving our design. Uh, we've been working more and more with Janine Vinyas and trying to understand the whole idea of biomimicry and how our building schemes can be much more like nature and how they can respond in a more natural environment. Uh, we're currently doing a project at the University of Georgia um, uh, where we're really trying to look at having a living, living wall of the buildings so that they really do take the heat and extract the heat in a much more positive way. Streamways here and habitat that was abandoned and, and uh, disappearing and recreating through the campus and, and having the skin be a green, green skin. And it's really taking these ideas that we learned at, at Odom and Lulu, zero water, zero energy, and zero waste, and applying them at a bigger scale. I haven't done it yet, but uh, they are in the process of raising money now for the project um, and also looking at how we can recycle materials, all the doors, all the frames, and all the wood in the are were recycled and reclaimed from nearby sites. In fact, the uh, forming wood lumber that was used for the building came from the Obama inauguration stage. So we had a broker in Kansas City who was able to make that deal, so we were able to take that wood and use it. The wood on some wood sidings from a mushroom farm that was nearby the site. And, uh, so, very simple and elegant building. And if you're interested, you can get this book online that tells you all about how the building is built. Um, similarly, uh, in Des Moines, we have a project that was just completed that we believe will use about a third of normal energy. So it's all 67% energy savings. And it just opened, so we'll see over the next year how it does. Um, I, some of you, I'm sure, know Rod Cruzzi from HLKD. Yeah, you look at this building and not know Rod Cruz was involved, if you know Rod's work. I mean, it just looks like Rod. It's a wonderful site that looks at the Capitol. Uh, ground source heat pump system that we were intended to be vertical, but we found the rock was too hard and there were a series of caves below the site so we couldn't put the ground vertical ground source in. So we made a very quick change and put in a horizontal system uh, to avoid the, the voids in the earth. Simple, elegant plan that uh, allows maximum daylight into the building. So that you can see here, including all the casework and furniture to allow that daylight penetration very deep into the building. I thought the stair was especially nice. I was not involved with all this. It's like I said, the Dwight office did all this work. So we started in 1990 working with the um, Committee on the Environment. just re-engaged by USGDC to think about what the next generation of lead wants to be. And I think we're all kind of disillusioned by what we need to become in terms of being numbers game and how many points can we get rather than really doing creating better buildings, which is really the goal. And so we're looking at a new tool now with them that they had branded region. We actually called it generous and then they took it into the token marketing agency said region is a better name. So, um, and this is just a little bit about that idea. And it's really taking the power of the computer and the data that we have today and looking at it in a different way. Let's move to the next slide. It's, it's really just a concept at this point, but it's really thinking about the earth and, and, and breaking it down into four zones, if you will. Uh, the idea of Economic system of God, a whole social system here, the resilient natural systems, and the high performance construction systems, and valuing those based on your particular project. So that certain things, like in this case, cultural heritage on the left may be far more important than social justice. And then as you go through the design process, really understanding how that impacts what you want to do. And valuing that and looking at the matrices and the interconnections that are made and where those values fall. And sometimes they're positive, sometimes they'll be negative, but really understanding the web and that data and using, using the power of the internet to, to connect the information. So in this case, let's just choose water as, as a component. And so see what we care about for that community. And um, the idea is that you can 
group together with those items and those components and really pull all the information out there and figure out which of those things and which resources we're going to use to the most power in the project and try and create the best project. And like I said, we've only started this with them now, um, but the goal is, is to stop thinking about how do I get 60% of the points to be black or whatever it is, and instead, how do I create the best building at the end of the day that's going to perform at the highest level. And then lastly is this idea of community transformation. And I think for me that's probably the most important thing, is how we're engaged in communities. Um, we're currently working in Oberlin, Ohio, in a project that we think is really going to be transformative. I don't know how many of you know much about Oberlin College, but it's the first college in the United States that admitted a person of color. It's the first college to graduate a woman. And it's the first project that had a platinum building. So they have a lot of first on the campus. They're also the first site in the Bush Clinton Climate Initiative project to be in a small community. And so they are a member of the Clinton Climate Initiative sites, um, as these other all are around the country. And their goal is to be the first post-carbon community in the United States. So they're really very aspirational. And the very first project that they're doing is a small project on the campus of the Green Arts District. And the goal is to create a carbon neutral campus for the arts group. And we've been working with them now for about two years with David Orr. They're in a fundraising mode now. It should really be a net zero project, not just a building, but a whole, in this case, uh, two square block area of the campus that would be net zero. Um, so we're very excited about the potential. We've also been hired by the school district now for the K-12 district to do a do school for them as well. That would Carbon school. So there are communities that are really pushing, and we've been fortunate to be kind of at the forefront of that. So most of you know our, our role probably in Greensburg, Kansas. Um, we um, received a call two days after the tornado hit in Greensburg. Um, you can kind of see a lot of the devastation in that slide from the governor's office asking us to get involved because she had a vision to recreate Greensburg Green. That didn't come from us, it came from Catherine Sebelius, the governor of Kansas. So um, we didn't go out for selling anything. She decided that it was a perfect opportunity to reinvent Greensburg. Um, that's what it looked like, uh, a sea of rubble with the great powers left standing. We, we worked there fairly hard. The first community in the United States that required all public buildings to be lead platinum in the rebuilding. The citizens really adopted it. Um, they recognized that they were a dying community. They had been losing 5% of the population for the last 20 years. I mean, they were just slowly dying. And they realized the only chance they had was to change how they did things. So they came up with this statement um, about what they valued. And that obviously, they were going to the family and looking for future generations. They wanted to keep their community. The one thing I would say, that doesn't look like Greensboro. It's just flat as so uh, our marketing folks said this idea of I know I've been there a lot. You drive for two hours and I don't think you see anything more than about 100 feet high. Uh, but we also got very engaged in the community and our staff went down and, and created several public parks for them and worked with them on weekends. Uh, we created this park in a week's period of time working around the clock with CBS News. They called us and asked if on the one year anniversary if they couldn't help put a park in place and they provided all the materials. And we got a contractor to come down from Kansas City and several of our staff went down and drove off that's literally night and day to get it up and running so that on the anniversary day they could have a new park. So here's some images of the new results. And uh, President Obama has had wonderful things to say about it. It's a long way from being a healthy community, if I have to be honest. They have not found businesses to come back, so they're still struggling. But uh, the buildings are performing well, and uh, I keep my fingers crossed for them. We're currently now working in Tuscaloosa. We were contacted uh, by the mayor of Tuscaloosa and asked us to come down to help them uh, with the following the tornado that they did there. And this was the wine mixer information that I shared earlier about gathering information. They have a mayor who's very interesting. They refuse to take any federal assistance. And they're doing it all without federal assistance. So they only had $250,000 to pay for our fees. So when we looked at it, we said, well, we can't do all these community meetings. So we came up with 
this idea of my mixer and the fact that we have far more people engaged than we have in the And the ideas have been very good. Um, and in fact, that's where Bob is this week. So we're now working with the community, and it has not been without some hiccups along the way because some people just want to put it back the way it was. And it was an old racially divided community, and with no public input, no public transportation, no public parks. It was just, and so the mayor has been very heavy handed in terms of taking over public space and re envisioning what it can be. So it, it will be a challenge to get it put into place. We're also working with the Ogallala Sioux right now for a major. Um, housing and redevelopment campaign in uh, South Dakota. And one of our staff members is um, uh, half of the so he's now living up there and working with his family and doing this. So it's been interesting how we get engaged in these kinds of projects. And obviously, back to our initial work in New Orleans, um, we were going to celebrate our 35th anniversary we got more involved. And I'd like to say it was one of us who came up with this brilliant idea of my partner, David Image, his wife, saw it on the news and she said, you know, I think you should cancel the party and send everything to New Orleans. So we canceled the party and sent all of our money that we were going to do to New Orleans to the um, university there. And then we also sent a group down to help rebuild. And subsequent to that, got hooked up with um, Brad Pitt and the Make It Right Foundation and now a series of homes with the Make It Right Foundation um, because of that. And the University of Missouri, Kansas City, who sponsored a studio that has done a number of projects down there. So it's just making an investment in the community. In this case, it wasn't the Kansas City, but it was in the project that we felt like really needed help in a desperate way. So there's a lot of folks in that community that were, that were engaged in the process, and they don't look like us. So, but um, the same thing, the first thing we did was to create this playground in the community so the kids had a place to play. And then there's one of the homes that we have, I think there are nine homes now that have been built. Eight, eight or nine firms, and each firm had, I'm not sure of the number, but about 10, 10 of their homes built in this period of the election. Um, Lake Plato, there was a whole series of firms that were engaged. We're also doing work in Montreal for a group called One Planet Community. It's the idea that you start to think about only building projects that one planet can support. It's been very interesting to use their natural principles. And they do a lot of work in Canada and Europe, um, kind of looking at those kinds of ideas and starting from the start that every decision you make has to be what can this one planet support, not how can we as the United States take 10 times our fair share. So that, that's pretty much it. We're back to where we started. Um, and we kind of use this a lot. Um, that, you know, we view ourselves as better than leaders in all this. And not maybe consciously, but just because what we want to do. Um, if you're interested, uh, you can take a photo of this guy because somebody invested a lot of effort to make it work. Um, but I think this is uh, the, the grandfather of the uh, young man I told you about who works with the old law series of photo from, from the Sioux, Sioux Reservation. Um, and the quote that Bob likes to use about the future belongs to those who give the next generation a reason to go. I think that's really what we try to do. So, we'd be happy to answer any questions. How does uh, work flow through the office? I mean, how do you, you know, how does a you know, team set out up or flow it or how do you, you know? Finish. How does it work? Um, you know, I suppose we're much like everybody else. You know, we still have to go find work, and that largely falls the responsibility of the principal, and then we all have teams that we work with. Um, we are loosely divided into four studios in Kansas City. Obviously, the one is its own studio, its own market sector. Um, we've intentionally avoided trying to be segmented. Certainly in the 1990s, office buildings carried the firm. Uh, but when office buildings were dying, we were fortunate that we saw it coming and really focused on getting involved in public sector work. And we made that change about two years before it happened. By, I guess we were smart. I don't know. I didn't know it at the time. But we got there before everybody else did, so that was going up. But um, 
we're very, we're not very good at restructuring. Um, you know, everybody works on projects. One of the things I love is the fact that I still am a project manager on projects. So I am very active and hands on, and you know, we generally have the normal kind of hierarchy that I think we all think about a senior project architect, a project manager, and then younger staff on the project. The younger staff basically carry getting the project done today because they're all very conversant and and fast and can do things that those of us like me can't do anymore. Uh, I feel um, more and more impotent every day. I mean, you just, you know, you can't do the things that the computer can do, and it's very frustrating. But um, we have, like I say, four studios, and, and if I were going to tell you we have basic areas, we do have basic areas. This whole idea of entertainment areas, the arts venues that, that came about really as the relationship with Stephen Ross that we're currently working with him now at Princeton in Columbia and he would be invited into the University of Iowa. So we have three, three ongoing projects that involve about 16 people. We're currently doing work with the Boy Scouts that have about 16 people on the national campsite in West Virginia. So it's very much project related and we pull teams together based on that. We're doing work at UCLA right now that we have two people in Los Angeles working and then six people in Kansas City working. So, you know, I think it's much like what everybody else does. And we do have a few people who have really great technological skills for daylighting and computer modeling in terms of energy modeling. And they work on all projects. They're not isolated to a project. And then we work very hard to keep them happy because we can't afford to lose them. It's probably the one unique thing and they get paid a disproportionate amount of money, in my opinion, compared to what I think is really hard for what the regular architect does. And I still believe a lot in the regular architect. I'm old-fashioned about that, but I think what we do is really hard, and we need to remember that and appreciate those people who really work you know, the long hours and get it done. Well, what, uh, so what role does the Yeah, I would say, you know, from an architecture perspective, it's primarily the Midwest, whether it's Iowa State, Nebraska, K-State, KU, um, St. Washu, um, Oklahoma, I'm just trying to think about four people from the a couple of uh, Harvard GSD folks on the staff, we have a couple of folks from MIT, we have some folks from Berkeley, and those have primarily happened in the last 10 years as we've gotten more well known and they've come to us and wanted to, you know, I think they have this uh, social objective in their minds and they really want to do something that makes a difference. And they're so smart, it's just to feel really proud and really not very smart <laughs> to be around it, to be honest with you. Uh, we have a young man, Stephen Hardy, who is of our planning group, who is from Salina, Kansas. But he started out in law degree and worked as a, an aide in D.C. and then decided to get involved in design. And as Jesse is a master's degree from Harvard, and the guy is so smart, it's just amazing. Um, and so passionate about what he does. But you know, we find those kind of books. Anything else? How did you select your uh, mechanical electrical engineers? And in a in couple buildings that weren't performing as well as you know, the mechanical engineer question is always a tough one because we have a really hard time finding good mechanical engineers, to be quite honest. Um, and that isn't to say anything negative, but we have high expectations for them. And I, I, I'll tell you a story about what we, we hired an engineer recently and he came in and we started negotiating a fee. And he said, well, I can give you this fee. If this level of engineering, this fee, you know, this level of engineering. And I thought to myself, no, no, shouldn't you just have one fee to do good engineering? And um, so we've been really fortunate. We've done an awful lot of work with Eric. We've done an awful lot of work with Integral and Kevin Hyde and uh, folks that I think are really on the cutting edge of sustainable design uh, that are really, really good. But when we work in Kansas City on Kansas City buildings, you know, we have clients who want to know who's going to be there when they have a problem. So we have a lot of uh, folks there. Um, some have been good, some have been 
so good. We worked with um, Alabama Associates from here and had good success on projects. Um, it just depends on that we're working with a firm called Transolar right now out of New York and out of, um, I think they're Stockholm, and they're remarkable. But once again, they do some really high end, high end projects, and it's a Stephen Hall project, and they found that when you get exposed to them, you just blow them away by what their capacity is. I mean, they're so good and so forward thinking, and then you come back and somebody's like, well, I'm going to go on my own. It's like, I just left a project where people really are thinking outside the box and they're engaged, and you're telling them you're going to go on one time and not even help. So it's, it's a constant battle. Probably two months. <laughs> So the question was, do we have in-house landscape architecture that we hired out? We actually do have a landscape architecture group, but it's small. Um, I, I will tell you, and I say it with great pride, we received more than 10% of the national ASM awards this year from a small group, and three of them were research, which I found even more remarkable because they were all um, K-State graduates who did it, and um, that's not saying anything bad about K-State, but I just thought it was remarkable that we were uh, that was just doing analysis of water, basically water collection and water systems would be recognized at that level. Um, but we, because we're small, we 